Amen. Can we give it up, can we give it up for the, uh, the praise team and for Brady one more time for leading us? Really grateful for y'all and what y'all do. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Connor, and I'm one of the pastors here. And I am so excited to be worshiping with each and every one of you this morning. You know, you never know what's going to happen uh, when we gather. Don't run, underestimate what can happen whenever we worship. You know, you can say the words that you've read a million times in a worship song, but then one day it can just click, and you can be like, wow, is that true about God? Is that true, that thing I'm saying? Or you can be praying, and maybe a lot of the times you've prayed the same words, had the same thoughts, but there could come one time when things are different in your mind, in your head, or your, or your heart has that warm feeling, and you start to pour out before God, and you believe more than ever what God says about you. Don't underestimate what can happen in moments like this. You know, we've been in this year-long sermon series on Sundays, which is really a journey through the Gospels, and the next few weeks we're going to be spending time in Matthew, and we're going to look at some passages that maybe you've read before. Maybe the scripture we're going to be looking at is familiar. But again, don't underestimate what God can do for you in moments like this. Because when Jesus says in Matthew 18, 20, when two or more are gathered in my name, I am there also. When we gather, the Holy Spirit can do something amazing in your heart and in your life. So our scripture today is the one that Brady just read, Matthew 5, 13 through 16. And real quick plug, uh, we're going to be reading scripture a lot in this room. Um, and some of us, it's nice to have a hard copy Bible. And if you don't have one, we have some in the back of the room for you to use. You can, you can steal them from us, uh, and it's really no big deal. Um, but we want you to have that if you don't have a Bible and you want one. Um, so just throwing that out there. Our passage for today lies near the beginning of the greatest sermon of all time. Way better than this sermon is going to be, the Sermon on the Mount. In the TV show, The Chosen, when Jesus is planning out the Sermon on the Mount, he, he considers starting with the words that we just read. You are the salt. And the disciple Matthew, who's with him when he's planning out the sermon, is like, that's weird. Don't do that. That's a weird thing to call someone. And I get that. Because that's an odd identity statement to make for someone. You are salt. I feel like salt gets a bad rap these days. We're always being told to watch how much salt we're eating. When I was in high school and college, if someone was bitter or annoyed, you would call them salty. Yeah, some, some nods back there. I got, Connor, why are you acting so salty? I got that a lot. Um, when I would be at my granny's house and she'd cook us a meal, my parents always told me to not put salt on the food before you took the first bite because that was rude. And younger me was like, how can salt be rude? That doesn't make sense. So at first glance, Jesus calling us salt might be weird or off-putting, but salt for the people of that day was precious. It was a highly valued commodity. Roman soldiers in Jesus' day, instead of being paid, being paid in gold a lot of the times, would be paid in salt. The Latin word for salt, salarium, is where we get our English word, salary. So salt was valuable because it had so many great qualities for people of that day. Qualities that Jesus thinks that those who walk with him will have. First off, Salt was connected with purity. People back then thought because it glistens white, which can look cool, and because you can find it naturally occurring in nature, that it's pure. So all day long at the temple in Jerusalem, sacrifices were made with salt. So if we're to be the salt of the earth, then Jesus is saying that we're supposed to be examples of purity. And I'm not talking about the type of purity with the purity bracelets that dominated the 90, not that cut type of purity, but purity in our, our moral standards, our morality being pure. Everywhere you go in the world, you see standards being lowered. Honesty is so readily exchanged for dishonesty. Diligence is traded for laziness. Relationship standards are lowered. A lot of us have people in our lives who, instead of waiting for someone or pursuing someone that loves the Lord or is kind and selfless, a lot of us know people that settle 
for someone that's just not a good match for them, just not a supportive partner. And so as followers of Jesus, we're supposed to uphold the good standards of honesty, faithfulness, not allowing our hearts to get tarnished by the world. Another quality of salt is that salt preserves. In the ancient world, salt was the most common preservative for food, kept things from going bad. There were no fridges back then, so to keep those really bad smells away, you would cover your food in salt. And just like how salt preserved food from corruption, Jesus is saying that we're supposed to I was talking with my wife, Kate, about what's the word for this, and I think Jesus wants to ha- us to have an antiseptic influence on life, to, to preserve things in our life from corruption. We all have people in our life that are just so nice and kind, and it's really easy to be a good person around them because they're just like just the best person on earth. And we also have people in our lives that it's really easy to relax those moral standards around them. Maybe some jokes that you wouldn't normally say, you would say around that person, or a mean thing you would say, you would say around that person that you would never dream of saying around this good person. And Jesus is saying that we're supposed to preserve those good things in our relationships. Our our presence is supposed to make it easy for people to be good to have that goodness. And a third and most obvious quality of salt is that salt adds what? Flavor. Glad you are paying attention. I know we're supposed to watch our sodium, but y'all, food without salt a lot of times is just sad. I mean, when something without salt gets salt on it, it should be better. Like when you go to a when you go to McDonald's and and they pop those fries out of the fryer and then they just shower those puppies in salt. Can I get an amen for that, everyone? (laughs) Delicious. Who we are is supposed to be for life what salt is for food. The places we go, the areas we are, the relationships we're in. I mean, we carry the best, most liberating news in the world, so we always have a reason to be joyful and upbeat and bring a positive presence, and we should live that way. As salt of the earth, when we engage or interact with something, it should improve. Now, that's what it means to be salt of the earth. And I tell y'all all all these great things that we're called to be, but let me ask y'all, As Christians, are we always like that? Does our world think Christians are always like those things? No. Gallup did a poll in March of this year, and they surveyed around like 10,000 people. And they asked the question, are perceptions of Christians getting better or worse? And 77% said worse. For those in the majority that said worse, they were asked why. And the top answers were, Christians don't act any different than those who are not Christian. Christians look down on those who are not. And Christians are often dull and boring to be around. So top answers, they're judgmental. Their faith is not relevant enough for my life or they're not even that different from non-Christians anyway. There, there are memes you can find on social media, and the caption will be like, Christians 10 minutes before being mean to a server at a restaurant. And it's people singing in worship, our God is an awesome God. And don't get me wrong, those memes are hilarious, but it's also kind of sad that there's a kernel of truth to them. It's kind of sad. Christians are widely thought of as being the people in the footloose town who are judgmental, they suck out all the fun of life, and they just don't want to watch Kevin Bacon dance. They just don't want Kevin Bacon to dance. I tell you all these things that Jesus means by being the salt of the earth, how we are to be pure, how to preserve things from corruption in life, and how we're supposed to bring flavor to life And the tragedy is that so often people have connected Christianity with precisely the opposite. They have connected Christianity 
with that which takes the flavor out of life instead of putting flavor into it. And Jesus goes on to say in verse 13, he says that when, when salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Now, if you read this straight up, this doesn't make sense. Commentators and smarter people than me have argued what could Jesus mean by this. Some people have said, well, this statement's a problem because sodium chloride is a very stable compound. Salt is salt. It does not one day just not be salt. Other smart people have been like, yeah, well, at the Dead Sea in Israel during Jesus' day, what sometimes would happen is that salt would get mixed up with other minerals and it would get diluted to the point where it's just unsalty salt. Or maybe, others have said, what Jesus is getting at when he goes on to verse 14 and he says that a city on a hill cannot be hidden. It's illogical. It's illogical to have a light and hide it and not let it be what it's supposed to be. Light cannot not be light. Forgive me for that double negative, any English teachers out there. Light cannot not be light. So it doesn't make sense for salt to no longer be salty and for light to no longer shine brightly. That doesn't make sense. So why then is the reality that we see with our own eyes is that we are not always salt and light, but God calls us to be. What on earth is Jesus getting at? Now, whenever you're reading the Bible, Scott, another one of our pastors, is really big into this. Whenever you read the Bible, you always got to remember that context is key. In seminary, they didn't call me Connor. They called me context because I was, I was really all about that context. So, and the people that orchestrated or that organized our Bible, they broke it up into these nice sections with these nice little headers that make it really easy to just read the Bible as a series of separate ideas, like salt and light. Okay, that's an idea. But if you read the verses before this passage, the Beatitudes, I encourage you to read them. Jesus goes through what are the character traits of the people who belong to God's kingdom. And it's a lot of good stuff, like blessed are the meek, blessed are the pure in heart, Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the merciful. We can all get behind all that stuff. But then he goes on to say in verse 11, blessed are those who are persecuted. Verse 11, it says, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. Different way to read it. Each of you has a story. I don't know all of your stories, but I know that we all go through tough things in life. We get worn out. We get beat up. We mess up. The world out there is both out to get us, yet lures us in at the same time. And so it's confusing to navigate this thing called life. And in those moments when we feel spent or we've been slighted or we've been hurt, it's really tough to find the source in and of just ourselves. It's tough to find the source in ourselves to be that goodness in the world. We all go through tough things, yet somehow we are to be the salt and light of the world. But we see so many instances of Christians being the contrary. We see ourselves being the contrary. So if you're like me, you might be stumped wondering, how's this possible? How can I be the salt of the earth and the light of the world? When I was in middle school, I started going to the the youth group at my church, and there was a guy a few grades above me, and his name was Justin, Justin White. Uh, The only way I can describe Justin is that he was just a a a one-of-a-kind kind of guy. 
super outgoing, but also the guy you could have a really like serious conversation with, always just as ready to make a joke as he was ready to say something really kind and encouraging to you. Just to use a phrase, salt of the earth kind of guy. And it wasn't just his personality, but Justin was always like the most Christian Christian I had met up to that point. A lot of, a lot of times you tell young people in church, a cliche thing is, hey, the, the kid by himself in the lunchroom, go, go sit with that kid, go be a friend to that kid. And I'm half convinced that trend started because Justin would actually do that. He would always try to be a friend to the person that didn't have any friends. He was always seeking out the person that was on the outside. And when I was in 10th grade, Justin's senior year, I began to notice that Justin was bullied a lot. He was messed around with, picked on. People said really mean things about him behind his back. And I began to notice it. And I was like, how is this person that shows this like pure kindness? Why, why, is, why is that guy the one getting picked on? The nicest guy? Why? And I remember eventually expecting all of that struggle, all of that bullying to eventually wear on Justin to the point where he would not be the person that he was anymore. Surely like someone that like takes all of that flack is going to start to make changes so that people would like leave him alone. But then I remember seeing him on Sundays at youth, at church, and he was still the same guy, the same positive, hopeful, optimistic guy. And I didn't get that. How does someone go through all of that persecution and still come out on the other side just glowing with life? Other people um, did not get it either. And we were on a mission trip uh, that summer. He was about to go off to college and Justin shared his story, his testimony with all of us. And he talked about why he was the way he was, why he continued to be the person that God made him to be, even though he got a lot of pushback from it. And I don't know if this is his quote, but I give him credit for it because it stuck with me. He said, God is most glorified in me when I am most satisfied in him. God is most glorified in me when I am most satisfied in him. When you have God and you are satisfied knowing he has given you a, a new life, who you are will then shine into the world. We can't forget where the source of our light comes from. We don't create light in and of just ourselves, just like how the moon does not have light in and of itself, it reflects the sun's light. We are meant to reflect the light of Jesus. Our light is a reflected light. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. He says, For the same God who said, Let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of of Jesus Christ. Jesus lives inside of us. Christ in me, the hope of glory. I don't have light by myself, but Jesus lives in me. Therefore, I am the light of the world. And the reason why Jesus in this passage immediately follows up the statement, you are the salt of the earth with you are the light of the world is because when you show purity amidst a world that is impure, when you preserve goodness from corrupting influences when you're around people, and when you add flavor to this life with your joy and kindness and hope, you will be seen. A light is meant to be seen. So your faith is meant to be seen. It doesn't make sense for us to not be who we are when we know who God is. To have the good news of who God is and what God has done for us stop at the doors of Tyson Hall would be almost as ridiculous as putting a lamp under a bush. 
God doesn't call us the light of the church. God calls us the light of the world. Notice how in the passage, Jesus goes from world to city to house. And that's because wherever you are, whatever situation you find yourself in, you are meant to be light. In your marriage, be light. In your relationship with your kids, be light. At school, with your employees, with your employer, with your neighbors and everyone you touch, you are meant to be light. You're meant to be light. And y'all, the crazy awesome thing is, is that when you shine God's light into the world, when it's rooted in Jesus, who you are and what you do, when it's rooted in that light, we're promised that people will want that. People will want that light. There, there are two Greek words for good in the New Testament. One just means good, pretty basic. But the other one means that something is not only good, but it is beautiful and desirable and attractive. And when Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 16, the last verse in the passage we read, in the same way, let, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. When we welcome Christ into our hearts and the light we shine when we have him in our lives, people will want to have that light. The goodness of knowing Jesus and walking with him should be attractive to others, not repelling. Salt causes thirst. And so what we have in Jesus, when we live it out, others will want it and thirst for it. And God promises us that. In 1 Peter 3.15, Peter writes, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give reason for the hope that you have. When's the last time someone asked you that question? When's the last time someone said, oh, I see the circumstances of your life. Hey, I know what's going on with your life, with your kids, with your marriage, with your work, but why are you still so hopeful? Why do you still have so much joy? Why, what's going on with all that? Why do you keep blessing people and speaking life over people and not death other people? And you keep showing up and you have all this joy. And my hope for all of us is that one day we can all respond with, yeah, I'm different, I'm salt, I'm the light of the world, I have this source of light inside of me. And when you can stand in life's most difficult moments and still have joy and hope and peace and patience and kindness and love, it illuminates the world. And just like how a light is meant to be seen, a light is also meant to guide. And so when we shine that light, we can guide other people to the true source of light. That is Jesus. We're gonna keep talking about this over the next few weeks, what, what living out this new way of being looks like. What you have to do or what you can do, what you can let go of, but what you can hold on. But there's really good news today, everyone. You are salt and you are light, not because of who you are, but because of who Jesus is. Because Jesus has made a way for the Holy Spirit to make a home in our heart so that you could reflect the light that is life that God has given you. So be salt, be light, and let the world know what a life found in Jesus is truly like. Let's pray.